Hello and a very warm virtual welcome to Women Peddling the Way in Cycling as part of this year's Brompton World Challenge. Now just to explain to everyone why we're all here in the virtual world right now and throughout last week and this is because normally of course we'd all come together for the incredible event that is the Brompton World Championships and that goes hand in hand with this time of year and Ride London and, and everything we'd normally be up to. However of course for obvious reasons we can't come together in real life right now but thankfully we have the internet, we have the virtual world and tonight I'm going to be joined by some fantastic panellists to talk all things women's cycling which is really really close to my heart. For anyone that doesn't know me I'm Rebecca Charlton I've had the absolute pleasure of coming together with Brompton as I say in the last couple of weeks to celebrate everything that they are doing right now and we are seeing so many people on bikes and it is quite frankly fantastic so we're going to continue that tonight. So I just want to kick off with a little bit of housekeeping before we get going and before I bring in our brilliant panelists to chat everything women's cycling and first of all I have loved everyone's interaction on social media using the hashtag um, MyBWC so keep all those posts coming in throughout this evening and um, I've loved everyone's challenges, I've loved all the outfits, everyone getting involved and I wanted to just let you know it has been extended so if you're joining us now and you haven't already had a chance to take part that's now extended till the 23rd. You could submit your entry till the 24th and I'll be back next week with Will Butler Adams on the 26th and we will be judging outfits and everything in between and announcing those winners. Any problems, any questions that you might have that we don't answer tonight please do feel free to get involved on BWC at brompton.co.uk again that hashtag is mybwc and also put the hashtag myprl as well we want your questions and your comments um, and i'm pleased you ask if, if you could put them in the q a panel that would help me a lot because i'm going to keep an eagle eye on that while we're chatting with the panelists tonight and then i'll put the questions to them a little bit later so please do uh, put them in the q a bar rather than the chat and uh, and don't hold back keep your comments coming in throughout our chats i'm sure uh, there'll be some inspiring things to pick up on as well and we'll get to them at the end. Now, I will welcome our guests in one by one in just a moment because I know we're really excited to meet them. Um, but I wanted to just tell everyone a little bit about why I'm here and why women cycling and my passion for that side of the sport is, is so, so great. And that's because I had um, a lot of male influence actually in my life that got me into the sport of cycling. And I started racing as an under 10 on velodromes mostly. And for me, you know, I absolutely adored it. Of course, I'm still in the sport. I got the bug. But what I didn't have around me was female role models, um, other girls on bikes, women to look up to on bikes. I just didn't really have that network around me. A lot of my role med models were, were men and boys and, and I just really wanted to see that change. So I then progressed into working in the world of cycling journalism and now I'm very fortunate to report on loads of pro cycling and also grassroots cycling as well. So as I say, very close to my heart and I cannot wait to kick off tonight's panel discussion. Without further ado, let's put a virtual hand together and welcome Jules Walker. I think she's in the green room and waiting to come in now. Let's welcome Jules. Hello, good evening. How are you firstly? Oh, yeah, sorry, I was just checking you're unmuted. We like to do this protocol. How are you, Jules? Doing very well, thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm very good, thank you. Um, weather's cooled off slightly down here on the south coast, but uh, whereabouts are you? I'm in uh, East London in Newham, so we've had the rain, we've had the sun, we've had the heat that's come after the rain, we've had everything in between, so yeah. <laughs> Well, of course, we go back a long way. I, I'd say maybe, maybe probably best part of a decade, and we've probably crossed paths a lot, and um, namely both presenting on the ITV4 Cycle Show. Um, but for anyone that hasn't followed your journey as closely as I have, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to get into cycling and, and everything in between? Of course. So um, some of you may know me as Lady Velo or Velo City Girl, which is the name of the blog that I started off 10 years ago. Um, I'm a cycling advocate, I'm a blogger and also somebody who uh, campaigns in regards to increasing participation for women and especially uh, black and indigenous people of colour to get into cycling as well. Um, I had a love for cycling when I was a young girl. I looked up to my sister, so just listening to you talking about who you had to, to look up to, for me it was my big sister who's eight years older than me who used to ride around on a BMX, which I then inherited from her when I was seven years old. And that was the thing that sparked off the passion in cycling for me. Unfortunately, I stopped when I was 18 years old, which is a classic story that happens to lots of women and young girls out there. 
And then at 28 years old, I made the decision to get back into it, which is also why I started up the blog, partly because I wanted to, to chart my own journey about getting back into cycling and also because of the element of if you can't see it, then how are you expected to, to be it? For me, I wasn't seeing anybody that I could identify with or relate to. So I thought maybe if I put myself out there, if I can encourage any other women and young girls who look like me who are thinking about doing it to do it, then that's an excellent way to go. And something else I wanted to just touch upon before we welcome our other brilliant guests in is when I first started working in cycling, so I'd, I'd sort of finished a journalism degree and came into to the cycling industry as a, a magazine journalist. And I was lucky to have one or two female mentors, but as you can imagine, it was, it was largely very, very male dominated. And um, when you started coming into the industry side, did you look around you and see many other women? Not initially, no. I mean, when I started off the, the blog, that was a way for me to connect with other women who were in the cycling community, which was amazing. And that's what I now refer to as being my cycling family, the other women that I could connect to out there. But it was when I actually started working on the other side. So when I started working for a cycling clothing company as their operations manager, and I did their PR and marketing as well, I then began to realize just how much of a very male dominated industry that it is. So it took a, a while before I could start seeing the changes, but it still feels like there's quite some way to go with that too. Yeah. Couldn't agree more with that. And, and you know that I'm absolutely bursting to talk more about that. But let's welcome our next guest in because I know everybody is going to feel, a, a, you know, along the same lines as us. So please put a virtual hand together for Pina Pinzuti. Getting so used to this now, aren't we? Absolutely <laughs> loving the Zoom. I think Pina should be just joining us now. And um, if you could just bring yourself off mute, that would be fantastic. How are you and where in the world are you? Hello, Rebecca. Uh, I'm in Milan, in Italy at the moment. Um, uh, warm greetings to everyone. Um, so my name is Pina. It's a Turkish name because I was born in the most beautiful city in Turkey in Izmir and I have an Italian surname because I'm married with a super handsome Italian guy. Um, <laughs> so just <laughs> a little about myself. So I was born in Turkey, raised in Turkey, then studied and worked many years in Germany where I uh, started to recycle, use the bicycle again in my adult ages. And in 2006, uh, when I uh, loved this feeling of freedom and independence on my bicycle in my short distances in the city to go to the university or during my short weekend rides, I just wanted everyone to try the same and uh, experience the same. So I started to write a personal blog, which was Bicyclism in uh, Turkish, German, English, and in Italian. So in four languages, because I wanted to reach a lot of people. So a lot of work during the evening, after work, coming back and writing a lot of stuff. So what, when I realized that a lot of people were reading these articles uh, back 15 years ago, and uh, some people were convinced and they were using the bicycle, uh, then I realized, oh my God, but infrastructure is missing. So many people, but not so many experiences. Uh, uh, we're taking the bicycle and uh, trying to go to work by bicycle. So I said, oh my God, they need services, infrastructure, products. Uh, um, so I started to advocacy uh, first as an activist and together with the associations, then um, coordinating a move movement of people. And so it was my part-time job um, hobby as an advocate. In 2016, I said, okay, uh, this is not enough. I want to do it full time. So I could um, choose my title for my job, which is cycling brainwasher, uh, which sounds first negative, but then you think about it and you really, you're brainwashing. Yes, I do. From morning to the evenings, this is my job. I work for a company, private company, and I'm paid to do that. <laughs> that is the best term for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. Now, of course, again, I'm going to hold back till we got the others in because I have so many questions on cycling infrastructure, of course. But um, just briefly before the others join us, um, tell us where you've just been because you've been on quite an exciting adventure. Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, first excitement is that I could take a flight. I mean, my first flight in 2020 was 10 days ago from Milan to Helsinki to Finland. Um, uh, to cycle and explore the um, cycleways and the routes in, in southern Finland. I had sun 
I had great food. I had super funny people and a welcoming environment, really. So 10 days of cycling. Now I'm back. And today I went to the office and I realized, oh, I forgot the keys of the office. So I couldn't even get in. So, I mean, normally I forgot the password of my computer. And this time I really forgot to take the keys to the, to the office. But anyways, <laughs> it, was per it was nice. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like the perfect adventure, honestly. Absolutely fantastic. Now, Irene McLeese is waiting in the green room to uh, hop on the screen any moment now. So uh, once again, please join me in a virtual hello. <laughs> hello, Irene. I'm sorry, I'm going to do the standard. Yeah. yeah, you've got it. You're on it. Um, how are you? And where are you in the world? Good. I'm, I'm in Northern Ireland. Um, we've had a lot of rain today. That's not unusual for us, though. Um, although we did have some nice weather last week, which probably counts as our summer. Um, yeah, I'm originally from Australia, as you can maybe hear from my accent. Um, and I'm here in Northern Ireland because my husband is here, but I came kind of via London. I lived in London for seven years and I also lived in Singapore. Um, it was actually in Singapore that um, my husband and I had the idea for C-Sense. Um, it was back in... Um, 2008 when the big financial crash had happened in in London we moved to Singapore at that time and my husband had really done a lot of commuting by bike in London and when we moved to Singapore he felt really um, even more I guess a bit more vulnerable than his experience in in London and that um, he originally trained as an engineer and uh, he had the idea to to put sensor technology into a bike light um, and most of our, I have to say most of our friends thought we were quite mad because we had quite good, you know, corporate kind of jobs. Um, and here we were living a kind of comfortable life in Singapore, but we decided to give up our corporate careers, move from Singapore, base ourselves in Northern Ireland, and just with an idea of a concept, um, launch a product, um, which we've done now, C-Sense, our bike lights and um, other technology selling into 70 countries now around the world. Um, and we're now excitingly working with cities to use data that our products collect to actually help um, transform cities for cycling, better data insights to understand the cycling experience, what the challenges are for people so, so that cities can adapt to that. So um, it's been an amazing journey. Um, and, um, you know, it's the cycling, um, the cycling community has been fantastic and I don't regret leaving my corporate career at all. But always um, much, much harder work than I ever imagined it would be though as well. So hopefully I can share some of the insights with you along the way today. Yeah, I'm really excited to hear more from you. And, and I have to just echo that, that this is such a wonderful community, as, as proven always um, to be part of. And our final guest I'm going to bring in now is Karen Young, who's uh, waiting to join us now. So once again, put your hands together virtually. <laughs> Hi, Karen. How are you? Hi, it's great. Great to join everyone. Great to see you. Now we've been through everyone's little intro and, and actually normally I know I'd be straight in with the questions but I'm loving hearing everyone's sort of anecdotes to get started because I know all of you talk a lot actually as much as I do. So, so Karen, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm based in New York. I think I'm the only non-European represented today. Um, and unlike everyone else, I, I, my day job is not in cycling, although maybe one day it will be. That's, that's, a, that's a dream. Um, but in New York, I'm a, a community advocate for women's cycling. Um, I help lead rides with Rafa here, and I'm also part of a local cycling team called the Fifth Floor, which is also in London. So um, the women's the women's Fifth Floor team. So um, besides like riding a Brompton around town, I also enjoy like adventure riding and bike packing. So. I've had the uh, pleasure of traveling to Peru last year to bike pack in the Cordillera Blanca, which was amazing. Um, and then otherwise I contribute and, and write stories about some of the journeys that I've done on bike for a couple of cycling magazines, such as Far Ride Magazine and Bicycle Quarterly. For anyone that hasn't followed the fifth floor, I've got an interest in this because I, I raced very locally with a lot of uh, your team members and teammates. Yes. Can you tell everyone a bit more about that? Because it is, it is brilliant and very stylish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the fifth floor is a cycling team that began in London and then it has a, a contingency over here in New York City as well. So we're quite a global team. Um, in London, there's also a women's team as well. So 
The fifth floor really started out as a track racing team and then has since expanded into all of their disciplines. So we all ride bikes and are friends and love riding like everything from track to road to gravel to mountain biking. So it's really all across disciplines. I'm actually like one of the non-racing team members. Um, so I really focus on just, uh, you know, being an advocate for women's cycling in, in the community and um, representing the fifth floor in New York City. So, and yes, our, our kit is bright green and, and yellow, so you really can't miss it. <laughs> um, we call it Citrus Fade and it's, we're sponsored by Adidas. So it's a very, very good looking kit. I'm very envious of that kit. It is very, <laughs> very gorgeous. And um, Jules, I want to come back to you for a minute because of course I welcomed everyone this evening by talking about the Brompton World Challenge. Um, and of course I've always got an eagle eye on your brilliant social media. You've been out there doing the challenge yourself. How have you found it? Oh my God, it was the most fun I've had in, in quite some time. It was such a blast. I've, I've never taken part in the original inception of the Brompton World Championships that happened. So this was uh, a first. Um, it was brilliant to do something like this with my Brompton and be part of the Brompton community virtually as well. The fact that everybody around the world who is a, a Brompton owner was able to take part in it and it going on for, for longer than, than originally planned because it's been extended is amazing as well. But, um, Oh. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, it was it was great. So I was getting my folding skills on. I managed to do a Brompton fold in 17 seconds, which I was really impressed with. And then I saw a video of a guy in Australia who managed to do it in eight seconds. So I'm not that fast at it, but it was still quite an achievement. Sorry to interject there, Jules, but that's exactly the time I did. I think it's a brilliant time. There you go, high five, absolute high five on that. I was really proud it of it. You feel quite proud now that I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was being on, on the route that we did. I did the, um, the free cycle. So I did, um, it was like 22 miles, I think I ended up doing for the day. And you were actually bumping into other people who were taking part in the Brompton uh, World Challenge and doing Ride London as well. So there was this real sense of community with, with everyone who was taking part. And it was just a really joyous thing. And again, reminded me, of the fun that there is to be had in, in cycling. Sometimes that can be forgotten, sometimes it's all a bit too serious, but just the pure joy that came out of that was absolutely amazing. And I've just loved seeing everybody else's photos because I've been following the hashtags as well, what they've been doing and how they've been taking part in it. So it's been great. And, and that's something I think, you know, Karen, you've just echoed as well is, I mean, myself, I got into cycling very much as a racer, just because my dad and my older brother were racing and I wanted to aspire to be like them, you know. Um, but actually, the more I've got into cycling, the more I've realised just people are coming together in such a lovely community way now as a whole, where actually, even if you are involved with a race team, there's normally a grassroots aspect or there's normally some form of inclusivity. Would you say that's changed quite a lot? Yeah, I mean, I would say that um, a few years ago, I, and again, like some of you guys have said, I started cycling more seriously when I was 32. So I feel like I wish I had started earlier. Of course, I rode as a young kid, but there was a big gap in between where I literally was not on a bike. Um, so I think the, the thing that really drew me to cycling in New York is exactly that. It's the community. There is such a welcoming community here, and it's not just about racing. It, you really can choose how you want to be on a bike and you'll find a niche and a group of people to do that with. So the fact that there's so much diversity, I think that means like, you know, you don't have to race to ride bikes in New York. You can do it in a lot of different ways. And there's a lot of um, groups and organizations that are there to help you, especially for women. Um, even in the last five years, the number of options for women only um, just to get introduced and meet other women that are riding in the way that you want to has increased exponentially. Mm. It really has. And, and actually, I have, I have got a big question scribbled down to actually kick off on. And obviously, I've already gone off at several tangents because I love speaking to you all. Um, but I'd love to hear from everybody actually on this topic. What do you think is the biggest hurdle stopping women getting on a bike in the first place? Or I guess, as we've touched upon, getting back on as an adult? Jules. <laughs> I was just, just going to dive in. There are, there are plenty of hurdles that are often cited um, 
for women not being able to, to get into cycling or things that are stopping them. So you have elements of things like sexual harassment when you're out on the road. That's something that I experienced when I cycled in my teens and part of the reason why I stopped when I was 18. Um, you know, the levels of, of catcalling and abuse that I used to get just for cycling around in my school uniform was gross. And it's a shame that dudes who felt like they had free range and free license to behave like that towards me took me away from doing something that I enjoyed so much. There's the safety concerns and safety elements of being on a bike as well and your confidence being on a road is something that can be a hurdle as well. You know, answers to that could be along the lines of better infrastructure being built, actually taking into consideration the needs of, of women who are cycling also. It's the planning around it, which is something I was talking to, to the team at Sustrans about quite recently as well, is something that really still needs to be looked into. And the fact that we're still talking about this as a hurdle, again, shows you that there's still quite a way to go with trying to, to break those hurdles down and encouraging and getting more women to get into cycling. Mm. Pina, could I come yeah. to you on that next? I would like to add here some other experience from other countries. Um, since I've been coordinating the fancy boom on bike ride in 25 uh, countries uh, and in 120 cities, there, um, for example, the politics has an impact in or is a hurdle actually, like in Iran. Um, I mean, women cannot take the bicycle and go out and cycle on the streets. Uh, we could organize last year the first edition of Fancy Women Bike Ride in Tehran in a stadium, closed doors. So, I mean, this, this was the event, for example, and still the women were super happy because they could be together and cycle together, even if it was only for two or three kilometers inside the stadium. In Egypt, for example, there is a society is discouraging the women and uh, uh, it's not really not good for a woman to cycle around or putting the fun between the legs. So this is another thing. Or um, infrastructure, Joel's already said that, but there is one more thing that I have been realizing, for example, in Italy, um, the skills um, as adults, um, if a woman or man, if they didn't have the chance to cycle around in the traffic in the city in their earlier ages, then as an adult, it is very difficult uh, to adopt this, that skills of, you know, your reflexes and these kind of things. So uh, there are uh, courses or lessons for adults uh, who can join this, this, this trainings uh, to cycle something like two, three miles in a city, how to stop in a traffic light where the infrastructure is missing or how to lock your bike properly or when you come to the work what you should do you know these skills that we learn but when we cycle some people do not have it so they need this kind of coaching and this is missing for example and this is a hurdle for example mm -hmm. Irene can we come to you next yeah I mean um, something I found talking with cities um, you know getting more women cycling is a big objective because um, I mean if we're going to create modal shift it's almost that we have to design the cycle infrastructure to appear to be appealing to women as much as men um, and at the moment and what the way a lot of it is designed um, that there's not a lot of data to sort of really inform what they do so for example um, when they're looking at origin destination, where the most common trips happen, um, the data will use things like the census data, which is actually based mostly on men traveling into work. So you're looking at these arterial roads heading straight into town, where a lot of the journeys that women tend to do, because they're doing, um, they're doing journeys that may be doing school drop-offs or they're doing shopping and things like that, sort of a multi-trip um, journeys um, you're needing to actually have a bit more of a network planning approach to make sure that um, you can accommodate these these kind of journeys and that then you can build the, the protected cycle lanes and infrastructure around that which we know that women much prefer to cycle in and that helps to reduce a lot of the barriers um, so being um, this being gathering more data and insights talking to women and understanding what their needs are um, is a big part of being able to reduce some of those barriers um, I mean we've seen in London this data to show that where you know um, protected cycle lanes were built in quiet ways that the percentage of women you know that traveled on those lanes increased um, so you know being able to design more from that more inclusive approach is really important. 
um, to helping reduce the barriers, I think. Mm. Wow. Yeah. That's like super fascinating data about like gender bias with, you know, the cycling yeah. structure. We, and we actually, it's fascinating because we actually found on a project in Dublin as well that we were able to take some of our data and look at, okay, taking the most popular roads that were cycled in Dublin, um, we could segregate the data out and look at the experience of women versus the experience of men. And we found that overall women were having a, a rougher, experiencing rougher road surface. And we thought, what? I wonder why that could be. And then we kind of thought about, you know, back when I first started cycling and I was a bit nervous, I'd maybe think, well, you know what, if I cycle in towards the gutter, <laughs> um, I'll be safer because I'll be putting really myself in distance from the car. And then yeah. you think about that's where the road gets rough because the water runs off into the gutter there. And, so and interesting. we consistently found that women experience a rougher road. Um, and I think that's that's possibly why, because of the position, they're not, you know, maybe feeling as confident to say, you know what, I'm going to take lane position, I'm going to sit in the centre of the road, and I'm going to stop cars coming up and passing me where it's not safe. So, um, yeah, part of that could be education and training, but part of that is also about making sure you design cycle infrastructure that feels inclusive and feels safe for a wider range of people to be on it in the first place. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I in, in New York, and you guys have echoed this already, but I think the most common thing I hear from female friends that don't want to ride bikes in the city is they're scared of riding in the traffic. So, you know, the bike lanes here have improved greatly. They're not always, you know, well thought out in terms of their placement, but I think that's the number one thing that I hear. Um, the second thing that I hear is the equipment. Like, they don't have a proper bike. They don't know what kind of bike to get. I get a lot of people reaching out, friends and strangers, asking me, like, I want to start riding. What kind of bike should I get? Can you help me look for one? So I think even getting the right equipment can be an overwhelming task because you don't know what you should start out with. And yeah. there's so many things out there. And in, especially now, it's even hard to get a hold of a bike if you want one. So how do we make that journey and that search more like easier for women and and have those conversations so that it's not such an intimidating experience and I think the third thing is is bike maintenance um, and I know that's something that was intimidating to me when I first started in fact like I basically didn't do any bike maintenance <laughs> I, I never lubed my chain I never pumped my tires I was probably like really abusing my bike but I, I literally didn't know um, and then as I got more into cycling it you would think it became less intimidating, but it actually became more intimidating at a certain point because I had a fancier bike and I, I felt compelled to take care of it and I didn't really know how. Um, so all of those things I, I hear from women and I think, you know, I hear that women don't want to go on a longer ride by themselves because they're afraid of having a mechanical and not knowing how to fix it or not being able to fix it. So I think those are all things that can be addressed and, and you know, either through workshops or education and those are all things that we can work on to welcome more women in cycling. Definitely, and, I, and I'd like to, um, actually, do you know what, I'm going to pick up on a comment I've just seen, um, actually saying how fascinating that data is, Irene, about women riding more statistically in the gutter, and it, it's something I talk to, to people about, I know quite a lot. Um, has anyone got any advice, if, if we've got viewers here who are thinking, okay, actually, I do do that, but how do I build that confidence? How do I, I stop myself hugging it and feeling like that's where I want to be? I don't know if uh, someone wants to just dive in. <laughs> I, I mean, I can speak from my own personal experience. I think when I started riding in the city, I was actually at the time, I followed my, my boyfriend who was also a rider. So I would follow his line. And I think having someone that you trust who you can follow through traffic and see the flow of cars and how you navigate through tight spaces, once you follow someone and you do it a few times yourself, you become more confident in that path. Like I think you know, if you're just riding by yourself and you're like, okay, it's not safe to be close to cars, it can be, it can be scary to kind of take that leap and, and, and try something else. But, you know, it's actually safer to take the road than to be on the side because then the, the, the drivers have more visibility and are able to see you. But I think that's not something that comes naturally to people necessarily. No, I'm with, um, I'm with Karen on this one as well, because it was the same thing for me when I got back into cycling. 
I would often uh, ride with my partner Ian and it was the same case of following his line and basically just trying to build the confidence to hold my own when I was out in the road and you're exactly right about it being safer for you to be in in the road as opposed to squeezing yourself into the gutter where you're more likely to either have a, a bit of an accident or a puncture will happen as well with all the glass and crap that sort of swept into the gutter as well but it it can take time for that confidence to, to, to build and cycling with more confident riders is a huge boon to be able to, to feel like you're building up that confidence yourself. So yeah, completely agree. Another thing I found in the data, if I could mention, was that I found was interesting is that although women were riding closer into the gutter, they're also weaving a bit more. So they're, they're going a little slower and they're spotting the potholes and the little imperfections and they're kind of weaving around men were cycling more down the middle of the road faster and actually more likely to hit a pothole because they just plow straight through it. Um, so road surface quality is actually important to women and feeling that the, that the comfort factor of the road is, is smooth and in good condition is something also that cities can be paying attention to. So it's not just, you know, laying down a bike path, it's actually maintaining them when they're there so that they feel comfortable to ride on. Absolutely, huge, huge topic there. And, and um, something I wanted to move us on to a little bit is the COVID pandemic and the impact that that has had in terms of how many more people, especially women actually, that we are seeing riding and that did start through necessity riding or because they perhaps felt there were less cars on the road, they had a slightly safer space. Now, where that leads us to is the point we have now where I know I'm speaking to a lot of people that are thinking well do I continue to cycle or now we are going back towards the busier environments we had before you know where does that leave people and Jules I'd love you to pick up on this a little bit I mean from your experience and I know a lot of people reach out to you and you have such a wonderful community how have you viewed the uptake of, of cycling especially among women during Covid? I've been loving seeing it. I've kind of been living through it sort of vicariously because I'm actually um, in a, a shielding household, both myself and my mother uh, at the um, vulnerable category in regards to COVID. So there was this thing where I've been wanting to, to go outside and cycle more and actually feeling more encouraged by the fact that I'm seeing more women out there cycling, even if it's through social media or friends of mine contacting me to say that they've got a bike or they've got their bike back out of the shed and they're riding again and it's incredible and the momentum that has been going with that has been really encouraging and I'm really hoping that those in the industry that are looking at it, the transport planners that are keeping tabs on this too, realise that they need to keep this, this going. It's not just a, a fad, cycling can be a, a way of life, it's, you know, it's a sporting activity, it's a way to get you from A to B, it's something that can bring you so much joy as well. And like a, a friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine, Sharon, um, she started to learn to ride a bike a few weeks ago and it made my heart glow that she said the reason that she did it is because she felt encouraged by, by me in order to, to do it. And I just thought, okay, there's that positive impact of putting yourself out there, um, encouraging somebody else how to, to learn to ride a bike as well and then then wanting that to be a part of their life too. My big hope is that, like I said, all of these, the, the elements of the industry and transport planners are looking at that and just feel, right, we need to start putting things in place for the infrastructure. We need to start putting things in place to encourage more women to continue this. It can't just be an uptake and a spike and then it just all falls flat again. We've yeah. seen elements of that happening, say, with the, um, the Olympics. Obviously, when we got the 2012 Olympics over here, there was a big spike in cycling all over again. And then the dip happened. And it's just like, well, what is it that you need to do to keep that momentum going and to, to normalise cycling? That's one of the big things that needs to happen is the normalisation of cycling is so important that it's not this alien activity that you have to be the fittest or the thinnest or the fastest to be able to, to do, it should be inclusive and it should be for everybody. Yeah, so I can't nod anymore along with this joke. <laughs> and, and, and I will come to you in a moment, Pina, but um, something else I wanted to pick up on is, is something I wonder if you felt similarly to me, is of course, fantastic that we have seen government investment in this country where, where we're based and we are seeing more segregation we are seeing pop-up lanes we are seeing things happen but the key thing you've mentioned there is that sustainability and actually realizing how much that needs to be a sustained effort and an increased effort but something that i found on a personal level is 
going back to what you were saying about your friend being inspired to ride, I've been fortunate to be in that position with some of my friends. And I've had points where they've reported back and said, you know, I was really excited. I found this brilliant lane that went along this road, but then of course it just ended and I was terrified and I didn't want to go and I just wanted to get off and walk back. And that leaves me feeling in quite a, a difficult position because of course I'm a huge advocate. I love the sport, always have done. I want people to feel safe. And do you, Jules, sometimes feel a little bit compromised in how to best advise people what to do? Yeah, because it can often feel like you're banging your head against a, a brick wall. Like, I've been doing cycling advocacy and activism for the last 10 years. And then you find yourself sort of repeating things over and over where you know that there are still changes that need to be made. Uh, you kind of feel disappointed because it's almost like you... It's going to sound weird but like you take the pressure on yourself because you're so passionate about it and you love it so much and you want it to be brilliant and it's heartbreaking when you do get that feedback from friends or family members who have said well i gave it a go and this actually isn't for me you know um the, the roads weren't great i didn't feel confident i got harassed when i was out riding like i said that's that's really heartbreaking and the amount of work that still needs to, to go into it is incredible and there have been points where i felt like on my own cycling advocacy journey that i've just wanted to stop because it almost feels like we're not getting anywhere with this so as i said it's the conversation still need to, to keep on happening and the work still needs to be done and the investment really needs to be put into this to make it inclusive and better yeah and how brilliant that these conversations are happening though it, it's so so pivotal and pina i know that you're frantically nodding as much as i am and can i go over to you on the on the on the note of infrastructure and um, because of course you you've got that experience in in other parts of the world where it's perhaps working a lot better so i would like to talk a little bit about milan and what has happened here so we were hit really by coronavirus and uh, uh in the 8th of march we were locked down in our houses and um after 20 days as company, uh, we started to, as Bikonomis, we started to organize conference calls with the urban planners and the architects and the road, uh, road engineer, engineers. And we wrote a, a manual, a quick manual, something like 20 pages uh, for the cities to implement immediately to uh, resolve the emergency or mobility because we knew as soon as they would leave us, uh, they, would, they would give us the permit to leave our houses, there would be a great chaos on the roads and uh, we need uh, the food to, uh, to be accessible to the supermarket so there was still a lot of logistics coming in the city. If we privately would use the car and block the traffic then uh, medicines wouldn't arrive and the hospital would be blocked and these kind of things. And some of the cities in um, in Italy, they have picked up this menu, menu uh, immediately and they started to implement. And one of the cities is Milan, actually. In April, uh, we had the first pop-up bike lanes um, uh, on, the, uh, on our most famous shopping street, actually. It has the highest number of shops uh, on one street. And in whole Europe, I think it's 400 shops on one street. It's 1.5 kilometer of street. This is amazing, really. And uh, for years, we have asked for cycling infrastructure. And the answer was always no. So from one night to next morning, all the things we have been asking for so many years were implemented. It is amazing. I mean, they were really like you were going sleeping and the next morning we were we were allowed to leave our houses uh, in, in the beginning of may and i was going and checking those new pop-up bike lanes and the beautiful thing is i was seeing pop-up cyclists so all these new faces families all the family together cycling around and then there come the bike boom there were no more bicycles to sell in whole italy by the end of may I mean, it's just still like that. If you want to buy a bicycle, you have to um, wait until I think November, for example. So a lot of people are sharing their bicycles with their friends uh, who would like to commute to work, for example. For example, I have seven, so I have given over the two to, to my friends. And uh, so these kind of exchanges have started. The investment from the government was very important for the infrastructure. They have also changed a little, made some modifications on the road law and everything so cities could really start to do something pedestrian zones traffic calming and these kind of things so they were very very fast so i said oh my god all these things are happening now what am i going to advocate for <laughs> <laughs> so there we decided as activists and uh, advocates to 
work on people and communication. So um, that came out the manual to use these new streets and our new cities. Uh, we had to teach people, um, these new cyclists, how to use the streets, how to use the roads and this new infrastructure. So we started to work on communication uh, as company and uh, we created uh, some uh, manuals for the cities, how to communicate their new city to, to the users, uh, to the citizens. And we started to produce also, we already finished the, the manual for the private companies, how to convince more um, per per people in their, in their company to come to work by bicycle and creating also some safe um, ser services and infrastructure inside the company, starting with a bicycle fleet management, for example, not everyone can afford a bicycle, but they can still have one in the, in, in the company and these kind of things. So government and the cities are doing something and the citizens, they would like to, but now I think there has to be schools, universities and private companies uh, have to jump in the game and do their part. And this is happening. So I'm very excited for September and see if Milan is going to be back uh, to beat the city that we used to see, I mean, with air pollution and traffic and chaos and everything, so an un unlivable city, livable city, or we're going to have a new city here. So it's just two weeks away. I'm super excited. <laughs> I love this and, and I'm seeing so many questions by the way flooding in for us already so I will I promise as promised I will uh, move on to those in just a moment but Irene I know you, you probably got some really interesting points to pick up on on there. Um, well I think with Covid um, it's been lovely to see more people out, on, out and about on bikes generally more women more children as well taking over some of the streets and part of that I think has been because there's been less traffic on the road you know you can feel a little safer to come out on the road when you when there aren't as many cars um, but the the car use has come back um, and I think this is we're at a really interesting time right now where you know we need to try to embed that behavior change that we saw during COVID and make sure it is sustained um, and this is for cities a challenge now to look at you know where they put up these temporary bike lanes and in, in infrastructure in response how do they how do they you know know which ones they want to in, to make permanent and to make part of the network um, and to sort of yeah m try to extend this into a more of a permanent scheme so i think um understanding how people are using it how women are using these and were they useful and who's who's actually traveling on the temporary bike lanes that were put in place i think is a useful step um, because it's it's a it's i feel like it's at a critical point at the moment where we need to actually you know there's been a great policy change um, document which has been launched um, called gear change um, which talks a lot about investment in in cycling infrastructure but also even things like being able to prescribe cycling by a gp um, making access to bike share schemes and, and subsidies for bikes available which is all fantastic um, so and then also raising the bar on the the cycling standards for infrastructure as well so i think if we can carry through a lot and do a lot of those things that are outlined in that that gear change report it will go a long way to helping to embed that change but it's at a really tenuous time and i think it's going to take some political will um, to to sustain um, some of those challenges we've already seen some councils who who have taken down the temporary bike lanes that, have, that were put up during COVID. So knowing what and where and how to extend and make permanent is going to be a really interesting next phase. Yeah, yeah, couldn't agree more with that. And, and often seeing a bit of a postcode lottery as to where things have been removed as well. Um, okay, I know that Karen, we're gonna lose you in about 10 minutes. So I'm gonna fire some things out to the group before we lose you. One of which I'm gonna move on to in a moment is style on the bike, because I'm excited to ask you about that. Um, <laughs> But I have got a really brilliant question here. So I'm going to just fire this out to everyone and please do dive in. We offer mechanic and cycle training for women to help build confidence in Nottingham, England. Our uh, next project is with the Women's Centre who work with domestic abuse survivors. So creating a safe space for them is so important. However, I'm concerned that having a female only class will create a backlash from non-binary trans communities as they may feel excluded. Any advice on how to keep bike mechanics inclusive 
inclusive, but also respect women only safe spaces. I don't know if someone could pick up on that. I thought it's a brilliant question. It's um, making me think of when sort of skipping back also to what um, we were talking about with bike maintenance and sort of the embarrassment and the fear and needing to have a safe space as well to learn. So from my experience, it took me seven years into my 10 year cycling journey before I felt like I could do any kind of maintenance. But the problem with that was that other than the fact it got very embarrassing because I'd been on a bike for so long, it got to the point where I would have felt like an idiot because I didn't know how to fix a puncture. I wouldn't know how to look after like basic maintenance on my bike. It was also feeling like I needed to be in a place where I could be comfortable with that. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to do a uh, maintenance class with a London bike kitchen and they have a very small intimate space that they do that in, but they also have something called um, WAG events that they do. So um, women and gender variant evenings and women and gender variant classes that they put on to have those safe spaces. To me, that's one of my favourite examples that I've seen of bike mechanics understanding that those spaces need to be created to include everybody to be able to, to come in and do that, to learn, to feel confident, to feel safe and to have that safe space. So that kind of model is what I would suggest other, I don't know, bike mechanics or bike workshops to look at, to try and learn something from that and obviously talk to people within the cycling community who already have those models in place, who will be able to advise you on how to do it. The difference that it made for me personally being able to have somewhere that I felt like was a safe space to go to was immense. I could be comfortable, I didn't feel like any question was a silly question and I was surrounded with people that I felt safe being with too. So yeah, my advice would be to, to look further beyond what you know of the cycling community and the industry. Look at the other little groups that are out there doing something completely different, speak to them, share that knowledge and learn. <laughs> that is a, such a brilliant, insightful answer, Jim. Thank you. So before I move on to another question, does anyone else want to? to I would like to comment on the bicycle maintenance. I was very surprised to see that in Copenhagen, I'm um, with the 65 percent or percentage of percent of the people commuting with bicycle in a city like that with 600,000 um, inhabitants. Copenhagen has 600 bicycle shops. I mean, every corner you have a bicycle shop, why the hell do I need to learn how to fix a puncture if I have so, so much the availability and the service for, for that? So, I'm, I mean, I, I'm not ashamed. Yes, I cannot fix my bike on my own. I, I'm a bicycle user, but, and I don't want to learn it. Uh, so this is the another thing. So I want to have a service. I want to have in my, in my play, in my neighborhood, two or three shops that do that for, for me and then for a reasonable price. I think it depends on like how you want to ride a bike and, and what kind of safe, uh, self-sustainable sustainability you need on the road. Like if you're just commuting in a city like Copenhagen, where there is a bike shop in every corner, maybe that's fine but i think as you expand your rides or the length or the distance just being able to have the confidence on the road that if something goes wrong you'll be able to fix it um and not be stranded is i think something for me that was very empowering so that's why i think i've made it a priority to try to seek out resources and there luckily there have been quite a bit similar to london like women only um me mechanics classes or um you know 101 classes about how to fix things or introduction to bike maintenance that have really helped me and I've felt a lot more safe in those environments asking questions and learning. Now I mentioned style before and not only because I just want to get some style points by <laughs> ask you and hang out with you all. Um, I've got a little anecdote um, and I've scribbled a couple of things um, down here based on a headline I think everybody saw, uh, which was women can't cycle in skirts, of course. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you've possibly seen why that caused a little bit of a hype. Um, but, it, but it made me think of an anecdote. When I first started working in, in the bike industry, as I, um, as I said earlier, as a magazine journalist, it was a very interesting one for me because I have always been quite into my style, but I felt like I needed to completely transform the way I looked, uh, transform my appearance in order to be taken seriously um, in quite a male dominated environment. And I hate that that was the case, but it was. And I found myself wearing trainers and t-shirts and jeans when actually I would have loved to have worn a vibrant floral dress, for example. And, and genuinely, again, Jules, you know, working with you years ago, you did inspire me. And I did look at you and 
I thought, well, she looks fantastic. She's not apologizing for wearing a gorgeous bright red dress. So do you know what? I feel like I have permission to do that. And it made a huge difference having women in the industry around me that said, no, sod it. I'm going to wear what I identify with, what makes me feel confident doing my job. And why should I dress more like a man, essentially, which I guess is, is what I was led to do. So I've seen this headline, women can't cycle in set skirts. That's why people aren't getting on bikes. I feel like this is, is a really good talking point because it comes back to accessibility, inclusivity. We don't have to be head to toe in Lycra in order to feel included in this, in this world of cycling. Yeah, it's... Um... It's something that I experienced at the beginning of my journey as well. And when I got my first bike and as an adult, which was a, a Pashley Princess, so a big traditional set up and big step through frame, um, I still felt like I was under pressure when I went to collect the bike. Uh, just to give backstory, I got it through the, the Cycle to Work scheme and the Cycle to Work scheme allowed you to get your bike and any other accessories that you needed to go with it as well. So I was able to get my bike lock, I was able to get a helmet, but then there seemed to be this real pressure in regards to the equipment, the clothing equipment that I must have if I'm going to get on the bike. And it almost felt like I had a million and one voices saying to me, you need to, to be in this particular kind of attire. You've got to be in, even on a bike like that, you have to be in something that's sort of like aero and will enhance your performance. And, and I'm just like, no, exactly what you, literally exactly what you see me in is what I am highly likely to be cycling in as well. And it's just very bizarre to me that it feels like that other people have that kind of agency and license to say to you, you're not doing it right. I've had that said to me when I've been out cycling in, skirts when i've been out in just a, a normal pair of denim shorts or what have you you're not doing it correctly because you're not in the right gear tell me what the right gear is supposed to be if i'm comfortable in it and i can function in it on a bike then it works for me then that's absolutely fine and again that's something that feels like it's a hurdle that can be put in front of you if you don't look and dress a certain way then you shouldn't be taking part in this activity which is completely wrong so i don't know i i sometimes see it as an act of defiance almost with what I wear on the bike, even though this is just me and my everyday attire, it still feels like I'm saying, I'm, I'm not listening to any of your noise that you want to, to, to throw at me. This is who I am. This is what I wear. This is what I'm riding. And that's how it's got to be. Love that. And, and Karen, I'm going to come to you now before you've got to scoot off in a few minutes, because it, it, that's something that chimed with me earlier when I was sort of praising the kit, um, you know, which is, is very race oriented and it's quite frankly stunning. And what I think it personally comes down to for me is, yes, I love being head to toe in Lycra. I love it. But I also want to ride my Brompton and I want to wear, like we've just said, Jules, I want to wear what I want to wear without any judgment on that. And I think it's just about giving permission to, to actually just be you at the end of the day. Yeah. And I totally subscribe to that. I mean, obviously when I'm doing like a ser more serious road ride, I'll probably be wearing Lycra, but even that has changed. I think, you know, as cycling um, road apparel has evolved to be a bit more casual and a bit more about having fun. I think, you know, not wearing a jersey, wearing a t-shirt, which I love. Like, I love pushing the boundaries of, of what you wear on the bike. Um, in fact, there's an event that a friend throws every summer, just for the last few years, um, called TFTI, thanks for the invite. And the second day, it's like, it's basically a fashion show. So the first day, everyone's like serious, is wearing Lycra. The second day, like, everyone wears like the wackiest thing or whatever they want to wear. And that's like the most fun to me. I had this like vintage, like button up um, sleeveless white shirt with tassels on it that I wore <laughs> and I got so many compliments. So I think wear whatever you feel good in on a bike. And I think it's just another form of self-expression and you know, you shouldn't feel like there are certain rules that you have to subscribe to. Karen, that is a perfect note to finish on. I know you've got a dash, so thank you so much um, for joining us. I'm going to keep everyone else here because we've got some more questions coming in yeah. in the Q&A bar. But Karen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was so much fun. And I hope, you know, the rest of the conversation goes well. We'll see you soon. Okay. Bye, guys. <laughs> Bye. Um, Pina, am I right in thinking that you have organised or at least been part of a fancy dress bike ride? Yes. <laughs> Fancy woman bike ride. Um, 
Yeah, I was, I was coming to that point. First of all, um, the, back to your previous question, just one, one thing I would like to add, uh, because working as a woman in this male dominated industry and having an online magazine, uh, as company, we are also the editors of, of a cycling magazine here in Italy. And uh, very often I'm invited to media days uh, by the bicycle producers and uh, being there as the only woman, uh, we've been something like 35 male journalists and uh, standing there and looking at the eyes of the uh, PR manager of the company and telling, asking, how do you communicate your bicycle to the women <laughs> users? And uh, the answer is, we are not communicating to the women. <laughs> anything and you know I mean standing there first I thought oh my god it is I would never go to those places again I would never accept the invitation but then I said 95% of percent of all these sports articles are written by men and the 97% is talking about male male sportsmen and uh, male products so I should insist stay there and be myself and talk uh, womanly about all the themes and instead of talking about the uh, frame size and the weight and uh, whatever I would uh, just stay there and talk about the experience what kind of feeling it gives me so um, to the fancy ride uh, it was 2013 in Turkey, in Izmir, um, that we decided to show people that we could cycle in any kind of dress uh, and even exaggerated actually with high heels and really clothes that, that you would normally not wear actually. It's, you know, you have this piece of dress in your wardrobe that you say, oh, one day I will put it on, but you say, no, it's too much, I wouldn't. That dress is the perfect fit for this ride. Okay, <laughs> so we encourage women to cycle with us once a year on World Car Free Day, uh, which is the third uh, Sunday of September. Um, just uh, create this collective ride and uh, pose to the photographers and cycle a very short distance, something like three to five kilometers in the city center. Um, in a couple of years it became spread all over the world and many many cities wanted to host this event and the beautiful thing is none of the local volunteers are bicycle activists and 80 percent of our participants are not daily bicycle users so this this is the thing that really gives me the satisfaction we always say we do things and we always in our small community of bicycle users, we, we tell the same things to each other. We see always the same, same faces, but Fancy Woman Bike Ride has reached another type of, type of people, the non-cyclist group, and it has done it in, in three ways. Uh, so not going to the activists or looking for people uh, or people found us through social media and the photos they have seen from the event. and. They, they came to us and they said, hey, I want to organize it, but what should I do? And uh, we have created manuals, uh, so very funny ones. Hey, you should do this and that and feel free to organize in your city. No rules except uh, waving to the strangers and smiling all the time because there are so many photographs that, that maybe you don't want your photo later on if you have a serious face. Uh, so smiling is the first rule all throughout the event. And um, we have chosen a day, Sunday, which is which should be celebrated as a car-free day. Uh, so in September, the second thing is a large women group ride is always creates a safe space for people, so they are encouraged to participate. And um, the, and the minimum number of the cities, I mean, we have it in, also in small cities, but minimum number is 300 women uh, per event. In Izmir, where it, it has started, uh, we have 5,000, more than 5,000 women participating in the event, so it's huge. <laughs> I mean, the city now, they really close the main road to the traffic because we are more than any other car driver in the city, so they, they just think okay they are the major majority so we are going to close the city streets to the to the traffic so in that city uh, world car free day is really celebrated now and uh, the third thing is um, the message of the event is very serious actually we 
want our right to the city, claim the streets, and we want more visibility for, for the women. To be visible, I need to have space, so we need to take out something from our streets. And uh, these are not trees or buildings, but these are cars, for example. But uh, the event itself is super colorful and joyful. So we want people to enjoy that day. And the reason is, if these 80% of the participants are for the first time enjoying such a, participating such a cycling event, then it has to be a very positive experience for them. Because they have to come to the meeting point in the city center on their own, uh, maybe after many, many years that they have not been cycling. So they do the experience, they come, they cycle with us, and they have to go back home all alone. And if the experience is positive, then they would like to repeat this. So maybe next day they would also go to work by bicycle. So this is very, for us very, very important. And in these years, I can just say that, yeah, uh, we managed it. I mean, now it's growing and growing this September. I don't know if we can do a collective ride, um, but we will do something else. I think it's not anymore once a year thing, but cycle every day thing, uh, we'll see. Brilliant. I'm going to rattle through some questions now because I've seen so many good ones come in and I'm aware that I've got to let you all go in about 10-15 minutes. Okay, is there any data given to city planners and councils to educate new drivers on how to act around cyclists? I don't believe ever being taught that when learning to drive. If not, do you think that this would help? Irene, do you want to pick this one up? Um, data given to councils about what, sorry? Sorry. Um, more data given to city planners slash councils to educate new drivers on how to act around cyclists? Ah, um, I don't know um, if drivers are given this kind of data. Um, that's a good point though. Um, I think that education for drivers around how to how to give space for cyclists, particularly when overtaking, is critical. Um, and having um, you know, being able to give 1.5 meters distance and all of that um, is, is really important. And if more people who drive had experienced cycling, um, then I think they would have a better appreciation. Um, I know that the, the bikeability courses used to be, I think in the UK were mandatory at you know, one point years ago, then I think that stopped. And then I think they're looking at how to bring some of that back. And I think that is a fantastic initiative because if everybody has had at least that experience of cycling, they maybe know that, you know, a cyclist sometimes has to um, veer. They might have to navigate around a pothole, for example. You can't expect them to always to be traveling in a straight line and they, they may need to do that. Or even to have some appreciation of the fact that Sometimes it, it actually makes sense and is safer for cyclists to be in the center of the road and why they might be doing that. And also why sometimes cyclists are traveling to abreast and not to get frustrated with that and to understand, you know, perhaps some of the reasons about it. So yeah, absolutely. Education is really important. As for the data that um, informs that, I guess data to look at where collisions might be happening, where swerving and braking and those kind of patterns are happening, which could indicate um, conflict areas with traffic can be looked at absolutely in terms of either the intersection areas or um, we're using the CSENSE data to look at some of the, 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 um, the wider patterns across the city as well. So yeah, it's an emerging area, but I think partly is education, but you're right, partly is about data to help cities understand where those pinch points maybe are that they can try to address things. Just reading some comments here. Unfortunately, fellow women cyclists can be the harshest style critics. Well, certainly not here. Not in this, uh, not in this company. Um, okay, another question. Where I am based, the key decision makers are exclusively white, able-bodied men who are reluctant and or dismiss the need for diverse voices and input. I have tried my best, but I receive a lot of backlash, which is very demoralizing. And I've had to leave the local cycling group. Do you have any suggestions of how to overcome this? Oh my God, um, that's really sad to hear that that person's had to leave their local cycling group as a, a result of that. That's really heartbreaking. I'm sorry that that's, that's happened. Um, this has been something that I've been really vocal about for the last 10 years. And most people that follow me on social media or know what I've been doing, the messages I've been putting out, they will be aware of that too. And I'm not gonna lie, it's exhausting. It can be absolutely exhausting when it feels like you're saying the same thing. You're trying to get these 
institutions and systems to listen to you and there is no changes you know i've talked about the desperate need for it to go beyond just giving somebody a seat at the table you need to be employing these people into your your organizations and into your planning completely you can't just assume that it's not needed you know these 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 different demographics and these different diverse groups do not do not need this this is, doesn't exist it does no one no one listens and this is when i'm gonna go off tangent a little bit here but it's the language that is used around that as well is so important whereby i've had people asking me questions about what's it like being a black woman in in cycling how is that a barrier for you my blackness is not a barrier the gatekeepers are my barrier if um looking at being female is seen as a barrier no the patriarchy are the barrier with that the people that are still the decision makers the people that are still in power the people that hold the key and that's the thing that needs to change so it's those systems of power that exist within cycling within the industry within the planning they are the barriers and that's what needs to be dismantled and we are still working towards that we're still working towards those conversations happening we're still seeing elements of like what you just mentioned with the person saying that they had to walk away from all of that because they felt so uncomfortable that should never be happening at all that should not be going on whatsoever so you know our voices need to be heard our voices need to be recognized we need to be listened to we we have this power ourselves but it's dismantling that system of power that exists already is the really important thing but i'm going to stop and let somebody else talk now for the moment because <laughs> i could go on of that for a very very long time because it's something i'm super passionate about but like yeah no, no, I see everyone <laughs> saying absolutely brilliant, Jules. Well said, keep going. So, um, definitely. And actually, on the back of that, Jules, um, I keep referring to the fact that you have got the voice. I think ever since you started the blog, you know, you were putting your voice out there, and, and certainly from my perspective, you, you gained that audience, you've made a, a huge difference. Have you felt that? How much difference have you sit, sort of felt in terms of your voice being out there among actually an increasing number of voices that should be listened to? I've seen some changes. I say it time and time again, there is still so, so much more work to be done and so much more dismantling that needs to, to happen. Um, I felt encouraged when I've seen other black and indigenous people of color being able to to have that power in cycling as well or even creating our own spaces for that you know some people might see that as divisive having to, to create those spaces and that's something that i've actually had backlash for i'm a co-founder of the women of color cycling group that i co-founded with uh, jenny Wisdowski of london bike kitchen and watching how that has flourished and how the women within that group have just taken it and run with it is is important and powerful and you know sometimes i refer to myself as like a, a wizened old owl in cycling i've been around for a very very long time i've been saying the same things and trying to make changes for a very very long time there's the element of handing the mantle over to, to other women who want to make those changes too not being the only person that's carrying that on your shoulders as well because it can be a heavy burden and a heavy responsibility to have and it can sometimes be really painful when you put yourself out there i made that decision to put myself out there i made that decision to you know i've referred to myself as sometimes being that black mouthpiece if i need to be that person and share my platforms and use my platform to heighten and advance the voices of other minority groups out there as well it's important for that to be done this isn't this isn't about me this isn't about my journey it's about trying to extend that for anybody else who's in the same position who feels like this isn't a space for them as well so there are some some changes happening there is still so much to, to be done there have been times where i have wanted to walk away from it and you know that was part of the reason why when i said i used to work in the cycling industry i felt like i had such a position of power when i got the the role that i did working within the industry and then you hit a glass ceiling or you feel like you're banging your head against a brick wall. It sounds backwards, but I needed to take myself out of it to be able to use my power for good, to be able to do more because I wasn't getting anything done where I was. And I didn't feel like I was able to use my voice in the way that I could where I was as well. So 
yeah, there's been lots of toing and froing that I've needed to do on my, my journey. And I've spoken to, to, to other women who have had to do similar things as well, where they've had to just go, do you know what? I need to, to step away from this. Sometimes taking yourself a few steps out of it and looking at the bigger picture and then having the mental mindset to go back into it and do it again is important because it can rinse you. It can absolutely rinse you mentally trying to make these changes. And even when you've got an incredible support unit of people around you, it can still be hard. I don't want it to be a fight anymore. That's the thing that I think of is I don't want it to be a fight. I don't want it to be a battle. I don't want it to be looked at as being a woman and being a black woman is, is a barrier. It, like I said, it should not be like that at all. So we're still working towards this. And we're so grateful that you do and, and the honesty and you always speak with honesty and that from in my mind is, is the most important element that we do say when it's difficult. We do say when we've come a long way, but we also say that there is more to do. Mm. And, and I think that, that that is very, very central to, to this conversation. Now, I'm keeping an eye on the time, scrolling through the, the brilliant questions you've had. I'm going to throw one more out there before we wrap up for this evening. It's been such a brilliant um, conversation. What is the cycle training? Training budget like in Ireland, USA and Italy. A big barrier now is that due to COVID the cycle training budgets have been slashed in London at a time when being able to cycle is more a matter of social justice than ever. How can we get an increase in funding for cycle training because it's not just about infrastructure. I appreciate we've touched on this a little bit but have anyone got any thoughts on that one? I'm afraid I don't know the budgets. No, no. Mm. That's no from us on budgets. And okay, I am going to leave it there because we are almost at twenty past, which was my absolute cut off for us talking. I knew we would. Um, listen, thank you so much for joining me this evening. As you can tell, I could talk all evening, but it's been absolutely brilliant. Everybody, please keep your comments and all your posts about the championships and the challenge coming in at hashtag MyBWC and MyPRL as well. I know we'll all be over social media the rest of tonight and over the coming days as well. But thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>